Afternoon. Uh, I'm Russ Glasgow. I'm the director of the Dissemination and Implementation Science Program uh, here at Accords, uh, at the University of uh, Colorado, and also a research professor uh, in family medicine and one of the developers of the REAIM framework that uh, we're going to be talking about here. So Russ, to start off, could you describe in a few sentences how this REAIM and PRISM framework came about and how it is used now? Yeah, uh, great question. I'll, I'll try to. We uh, first developed back in 1999, uh, we developed what then we just called uh, REAIM to, uh, out of frustration uh, for the huge gap that I'm sure everybody in this audience is aware of between research and practice. And in particular, we felt that one of the key challenges uh, was that research focused almost exclusively on internal validity. So there were really uh, tight controls on what was uh, done in a relatively pristine environment, but a lot was lost on the relevance of the external validity of the generalization to real world settings. Um, and so um, we initially used REAIM to evaluate outcomes of different, it started being behavior change programs and then uh, has evolved uh, more uh, over time to be used more and more uh, broadly. The, uh, we'll, maybe I'll get to a minute. I have a slide to share with you a little later that shows some of the key changes. But in general, the way that REAIM has expanded is to focus more on context uh, it's gotten a little more complicated, although we've kept the same uh, key dimensions. And then we focused increasingly on using mixed methods uh, approaches with uh, REAIM. And finally, we now use REAIM a lot more for planning as well as uh, just for evaluation like it started out. Awesome, thank you. And I know that we'd love to go on to the next slide as you discuss the key components of the REAIM and PRISM frameworks. Great, uh, be glad to. Um, well, first of all, REAIM is an acronym. Uh, as you can see going down the column here, uh, it stands for reach and effectiveness, which are uh, indicators uh, of a program success at the individual level, we call this, the individual patient or citizen or, or end user. And then three indicants at the setting or the staff level, and namely uh, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. So, so those make up the, the key dimensions. Um, we have lots of publications, and I think a pretty good website that people can go to to get the technical uh, precise definitions and kind of the, the academic jargon around defining uh, these components. But for what we call real world use or more pragmatic use, uh, we've tried to change this into a language that's more user friendly and can be used like by clinical and community partners, as you can see here into a who, what, where, uh, how type framework. And the only one given our time constraints today uh, that I want to talk just a little bit more about is implementation. Uh, I think the rest are relatively intuitive for people, uh, but implementation started out being just the first line there about consistency of program delivery or what a lot of people call fidelity. Over time though, this is one of the changes that it's developed that we realize there's a number of other important things to add in there in thinking about implementation. And the first one is underlined there was how has a, a program been adapted or changed uh, during the intervention? Secondly, how much did it cost? And then finally, and this last one cuts across all the dimensions, why, why did these results uh, come about? Um, the other key aspect today uh, of REAIM is that it's morphed and we actually use the term now expanded REAIM uh, or PRISM uh, framework. Uh, PRISM itself, of course, is another acronym that stands, as you can see here, uh, for Pragmatic Robust Implementation and Sustainability Model. And the, the notion behind this is that uh, we need to bring context 
into uh, the into the model in a way that focuses on key issues that impact for better or for worse one or more of the reaim uh, key dimensions. So as you can see here in this slide, the oval there, kind of the bottom center, has the reaim dimensions displayed around there. And this slide illustrates how you might use this uh, framework when you're uh, looking to disseminate or study an evidence-based intervention and, and the way you're implementing that through strategies. Uh, for just a minute, let's talk about the uh, information at the top on these prism contextual factors. And uh, what we mean by uh, context is two primary things or large buckets. On the left is external context, and that probably is fairly intuitive to most people. And it means broader macro level things like the policies, uh, that are available, maybe national guidelines, reimbursement issues. Importantly, though, for REAIM, we focus on a few other specific things in terms of internal context out of the hundreds of things that you could uh, study because some people have said context is multi level and it means about everything except for the intervention itself. But what we focus down on are, again, characteristics of the setting uh, and the uh, the setting and the patient characteristics, staff characteristics. Importantly, the second bullet point there is also the perspectives. And this, this involves things like the history uh, around a given issue that an organization has, the relationships uh, among staff and different members there. And then finally, the last bullet point, and one that I think is maybe unique, uh, for PRISM to call out is what we call implementation and sustainability infrastructure. What we mean by that is the structures that are set up in an organization to enhance the chances that it's going to succeed on a long-term basis. Things like, are there adequate resources? Is there somebody that there's this job uh, to do that they're held accountable for? Are there mechanisms like audit and feedback to check on how it's going and create improvements. Um, last thing I wanna uh, say about this, so we can uh, get to the other questions that I know you have, is that the secret to using REAIM, and I would say maybe more broadly, uh, implementation science, is the fit among all these various components uh, on this slide here. So it's not just that you have a re-aim uh, dimension or outcomes or even all of these you pay attention to. It's not just that you understand the context. It's not just that you have an evidence-based intervention, uh, but you design a fit among all of these factors. And we feel that re-aim can be used several different ways. At the beginning to plan an intervention with your stakeholders. Uh, second, during the uh, delivery or implementation to make adaptations that might be necessary. And then finally at the end to evaluate when you wanna sum up or package and think about uh, dissemination. Awesome, thank you for sharing. So the next question that I have um, is just for you to describe what makes REAIM and PRISM frameworks especially well suited for planning pragmatic research. Um, good question. I suppose every developer thinks their, uh, <laughs> their model is pragmatic and easy, but I, I do honestly think that REAIM is a little more intuitive um, than a number of other uh, models or frameworks. Um, it's certainly less, uh, less complex. Uh, it has uh, fewer factors and some key ones that I, I think we have uh, distilled it down. Um, secondly, as I uh, tried to illustrate on this other slide uh, here, earlier slide, is we've uh, worked a fair amount to really with stakeholders to translate this, to lose some of the jargon translate it into to words that make sense uh, to uh, people. And then finally, largely through our website, but some of our publications too, we've tried to provide uh, increasingly specific guidance and examples uh, for how this can be used in real world non-research uh, non settings. Thank you for sharing. Next question. 
Can you describe a couple of examples how the REAIM and PRISM frameworks have been used for planning pragmatic research um, in studies that are ongoing or in the past as well? Yeah. Um, let me tell you about a uh, program that uh, we started, um, I think, about five years ago now. And it's had different, uh, started and stopped different times, but it is an ongoing line of uh, research. And the idea was to um, identify and implement patient reported outcomes using pragmatic measures, uh, very brief items on, we ended up with 11 uh, different uh, issues around uh, behavioral health, health behaviors, mental health issues uh, that were really important uh, to stakeholders and for prevention, and that were feasible to collect and act on within the primary care setting. Uh, and there were several different things that we did. Uh, the first thing was we worked with a uh, group uh, over time, several different uh, types of meetings and online interactions with uh, patients, patient advocates, uh, with clinicians in primary care, different types of clinicians, uh, with researchers to try and identify first what were the key issues and things that rose to the top were things like uh, smoking or tobacco use, physical activity, depression, um, healthy eating, uh, stress. And so what we did with these, we ended up with a total of uh, 11 uh, issues here, is trying to review the literature, coming up with, again, potential candidates, pragmatic measures uh, that could be collected that were very brief, uh, but were relatively face valid, that were actionable uh, for primary care. And then we did some crowdsourcing uh, activities to have these various stakeholders weigh in and kind of mix this all together and then came up with a list of items that we call the items for the My Own Health Report uh, system. This system, My Own Health Report or more, uh, as we refer to it, uh, is a web-based tool. It's an assessment and feedback tool that provides real-time assessment and then immediate feedback to both the patient uh, or the patient and family member and the healthcare team or, or the primary care team. Um, and the way in which we used uh, REAIM, once we uh, got these measures and, and we created this system, was to implement it. We, we worked with uh, stakeholders, including both patients and then staff in uh, different primary care centers. And in particular, we were concerned about getting a system that would work in very low resource settings. So um, we worked in um, 16 different settings across the country. It was actually two pairs of eight, because this was a, a cluster randomized uh, study trial, uh, a number of whom were community health centers that had really uh, low budgets. A number of them were, were quite diverse and had a, a number, maybe even predominant number of uh, Spanish uh, speakers here. So we worked with the stakeholders, both patients and clinicians in this, uh, to talk about uh, how to uh, phrase the questions, to present those, what types of feedback uh, to present, and to end up with a format that created some goals and action planning uh, for the patient uh, and the healthcare team to work on together. And just for example, uh, we developed uh, with flexibility there uh, using REAIM to think about issues of maximizing uh, the reach, the uh, successful implementation, how broadly could it be adopted. We did things like some of these sites um, had patients who could fill uh, out, uh, answer the questions at home ahead of time, either on a smartphone or a computer. Others wanted to do this issue in the waiting room, and some of the real low literacy patients uh, had the items read to them. Uh, some of the uh, practices did this in waiting rooms. One or two even wanted to do it in the exam room, which helped because the patients frequently were in the exam room uh, waiting for 10 or 15 minutes. And then the way in which this feedback was used too was varied and we worked with the sites 
uh, again, keeping in mind the re-aim outcomes for how, how we could tailor it uh, to, to fit each individual setting. And then we use the re-aim all, always with the end in mind of the re-aim outcomes to evaluate the outcomes uh, using our, our re-aim measures and dimensions. And we found, fortunately, that this system did turn out to be very pragmatic. It could be implemented. Uh, it uh, seemed to appeal. Uh, to both uh, patients and staff found it efficient, and it was significantly uh, better at uh, enhancing goal setting, action planning, and then at least short term uh, behavior change as well. And I think what I should probably do, you asked for a couple, but since I went on at length about that, maybe we should call that good for the, uh, for the example. I think that was a very great example. So one last question for us today. I already asked about when re-aim and PRISM is well-suited for pragmatic research. Could you go the opposite and talk about what some of the challenges or possible pitfalls to using uh, these frameworks are? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, first of all, although I do honestly feel that uh, the framework is more user-friendly uh, and things than a number of the alternatives, it still does have jargon. And sometimes it's still perceived as complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, people can scratch their heads, particularly in distinguishing um, a couple of things. In uh, particular, some of the differences between like reach uh, and adoption. Now, we're trying to work on that and address that over time. But it, it still can... Uh, Pre present some uh, c confusion. The other thing is getting across the idea that all of these are important dimensions and need to fit together. In fact, going back to why we created REAIM, that was one of them, is that uh, to try and get across that all dimensions are important. And if you think of it, in some ways you need them all in order to produce uh, widespread population or, or public health impact. And there's some nuances in that if you really try to maximize just one dimension, for example, effectiveness, often that has unintended negative consequences on things like reach, or sometimes that can even adversely affect uh, health equity also. So it's this notion that you really can't have it all, and all of these things need to fit together. The last thing I think that has been a challenge in working with real world settings is historically re-aim, and I would say I think this is like most other pragmatic theories or models, has not been rapid enough to keep pace with the demands of real world settings. And this, like re-aim, is a work in progress. Uh, we've recently uh, published uh, an article or two and are trying to work to make re-aim more rapid and especially be able to use uh, iteratively during a project. So you don't have to wait to the end to discover, for example, that implementation wasn't great or you didn't reach uh, who, you, who you wanted to. Thank you for going through all of that with us today. That's the time that we have, have Russ. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we end today's interview? Uh, no, thank you. I've enjoyed talking with you. And I don't know if you can see the bottom left, but the last thing I would uh, just leave uh, audience members with is we do try to keep our website useful and up to date and appreciate feedback. It's very simply, as you can see that, uh, re-aim.org. Uh, and you might also look in the journal Frontiers of Public Health, there's going to be a series of, I believe, 17 articles talking about recent uses and expansion of our re-aim. And again, today, we talk about, I like to use this figure, which is publicly available that you can see now, that we call our expanded re-aim PRISM framework. Awesome. Thank you. One last time from all of us at CopperCon uh, to you, Dr. Glasgow, for interviewing with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward to uh, interacting with you all, at least virtually, during the rest of the meeting. <laughs>